So, you know, the broken record's coming out again, which, which, you know, I know we're behind on time, so I can essentially skip the first two or three slides. But I first, I, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, Matt Weiser, who's a graduate student in my lab, who uh, this is really his work um, done in collaboration with Sian Mukherjee, who's over at uh, Duke University. And what I'll be describing is a, a, a new method that Matt's come up with that, um, you know, you need that catchy name. And somehow he was able to get net lift out of it. Um, so, EQTLs. We have essentially two flavors of EQTLs, cis EQTLs which um, I, I thought it was interesting. I've, I've also been able to incorporate the whole chromatin model into this as well that we saw about 50 times yesterday. So um, the, the idea behind SOSI QTLs is you have this direct effect on the expression of a gene, possibly through the, the differential binding of, of a protein. And the idea of trans EQTLs is that this is a more indirect effect, and this can be um, uh, mediated by in, in a few different ways. But one, in, um, if the, if the, the cis gene is a transcription factor, you can imagine it then going on and, and changing the regulation of many others. But I think we just saw from the last talk um, a second effect where it may be a more epistatic uh, interaction, or at least a way in which there is a, a, a um, uh, the cis gene is somehow affecting downstream the expression of some trans gene. And so what we wanted to do is um, use sort of this model of looking for trans EQTLs and actually specifically trans EQTLs that are operating in a regulatory function to come up with a model to sort of solve the problem that, that many people trying to identify uh, identify trans EQTLs are running into in that you, if you do a traditional all versus all method, you, you lose power because you've got way too many tests. Um, people have come up with trans EQTL methods uh, sort of in a general uh, framework of hot spots where you identify a bunch of genes that are, are co-regulated and then look for a particular trans EQTL that might be uh, associated with all of these. But, it only works when you've got a, a um, significant number of transgenes that are being affected. Um, so basically, we came up with what I think is a, is a fairly straightforward way of approaching this, and that if you're given the genotype and expression from a particular data set, we can use whatever method you want to use to, to determine what CCQTLs are. Um, and define however you want uh, what region around a particular gene you want to define as a cis EQTL. But at the same time, um, we're also trying to define an undirected uh, partial correlation network that gives us an idea of what genes seem to be co-regulated or whose expression are um, correlated within this network. Uh, in this partial correlation network, we expect these, uh, co we want these correlations to be uh, sparse. We want these interactions to be sparse, and so we use an L1 penalty to enforce the sparsity of this uh, correlation network. And then the idea is that we take the cis EQTLs that have been identified through uh, whatever method you want. In our case, we just used a simple uh, linear method. And we take this undirected gene network, and we use the undirected gene work ne network to define which association tests we're going to look at for trans EQTLs. And in this way, we severely reduce the number of tests that we're going to be performing, and so we can somewhat get around the problem of multiple hypothesis testing and the power uh, problems associated with that. So as I said, uh, NetLift, um, one of the, the big motivations behind this was to try to find a way in t which to reduce the number of tests that we were performing. But what we also uh, liked about it is that unlike um, the hotspot methods, you can actually still detect trans EQTLs that are only working on small sub-networks or sub-networks instead of requiring there to be a large number of uh, co-regulated genes. And with this method, um, uh, by combining it with the cis EQTL 
uh, uh, association, the cis EQTL gene, the gene in cis then is your potential transacting factor that is mediating the relationship between the QTL and the trans gene. So like any good method, we did our simulated data and um, the main thing I wanted to show here is that we were, compared to other methods, able to find better um, trans EQTL in, in, in smaller networks, uh, performance on some of the larger networks was about the same. And it's great to come up with a new method, but really, once you come up with these associations, you want to know, is this giving us any in useful information about a, a particular biological problem? So, you know, again, here we're going to throw in a rerun. So we looked at the same data that you just listened to in the last talk that's been around for a long time that's looking at 112 yeast segregants. It's about 5,600 genes and 2,900 markers. And I'm not expecting you to read this, um, except to, to, to highlight that in the, the lines that you can't read in blue are ones that have been previously discovered. So this is just to show we are able to recapitulate what other people have found. Um, those in red are ones that we are predicting um, that hadn't been previously identified. It's always tough to validate whether or not these things are real. It's a lot of ex experiments to do this. But so one way that we thought to look at it was by uh, noticing that a lot of these, uh, the downstream transgenes of these genes, if you do it a go analysis, seem to be involved in ribogenesis or somehow um, affecting the, uh, the activity of the ribosome. And so, we expected then, if, if this is altered, that we might see a phenotype in cell growth. And so using a method that had been previously published, we estimated the cell growth characteristics of each of these individual segregants based on expression data. And in fact, we did see that looking at the trans EQTLs, when we correlated those to cell growth numbers, we saw significant um, associations or correlations with cell growth. So we think that the um, trans EQTL relationships that we are finding are, in fact, um, related to uh, phenotypes for, for the different yeast. Um, and a second uh, sort of uh, evaluation of the method, we also looked at a group of uh, collaborative cross mouse strains. So collaborative cross is a, a large project that's um, being headed by a number of, uh, of labs, including uh, Fernando Pardo Manuel de Viena's lab, who's at uh, University of North Carolina with me, and where we are actually hosting uh, this collaborative cross res resource. And so in this study that had been previously published, they used 156 partially inbred mice, and in the way the collaborative cross is set up is they started with eight founder strains, six that came from the domesticus subspecies, one from the musk subspecies, and one for the castania subspecies, and they've started crossing these, and the, and the eventual uh, goal of this is to come up with a number of collaborative cross completely inbred lines that um, is, is going to be a great resource in, in studying genetic phenotype uh, traits. But we, we used some data that had been generated in some of the pre-CC lines, ones that hadn't been completely inbred, um, and looked at a total of about 9,000 genes and 170,000 genetic markers that had been defined from these. And what we found is that about, of these 9,000 genes, about 61% we could detect a CCQTL, and then about 8% we could detect a trans EQTL, which is great. And when we were looking at the trans EQTLs, though, we started noticing that there were a large number of genes that seemed to be associated with a lot. And so when we broke this down, a quarter of the genes that we found that had trans associations were associated with four or more loci that seemed to be affecting their downstream uh, expression. So when we sort of plotted out um, the different, you know, the gene positions versus where these trans EQTL associations were, we just saw an example of a nice trans band. Well, we saw a huge trans band that effectively covered all of chromosome 17. Um, 
And we thought, well, you know, so what's up with chromosome 17? And this, I came into this not being a big mouse biologist, but after this, I learned that once, you, when you're looking at the laboratory strains and, and these wild type strains, their chromosome 17 biology is actually very interesting. And one, so as we are investigating this, we wanted to see, well, is there a particular strain that seems to be driving the variation that is causing all these trans EQTLs. So the first thing we looked at is if we, by using the haplotypes that are defined in all of these 156 mice, once we mapped them back to what parental strain um, was actually on these chromosomes, and we looked at the expression of the cis-link genes, um, we found that the uh, PWK strain, which is one of the wild type strains, and it is the only strain that, that comes from the mus subspecies, the expression of those genes is significantly greater than those of the other um, haplotypes from the other founder strains. And if we then looked at the downstream transgenes, we also saw an increase in the expression level of these downstream transgenes from the uh, uh, when the cis gene was, or the, 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 the trans EQTL was coming from the PWK uh, founder strain. So chromosome 17, um, for those of you who are uh, big in speciation and big in mouse biology you will have known that this is a, uh, had been mapped um, previously to a, a, an effect called hybrid sterility, that if you took People noticed that if you took this wild type strain from the uh, musk subspecies and crossed it with one of the domesticus um, uh, laboratory strains, it leads to male sterility. Um, when they did their genetic mapping studies long ago, they found that it, it localized to regions on chromosome 17, and actually this is, a gr has, is developing into a great model system for uh, looking at speciation. Um, so, one hypothesis is that the reason we're getting all these trans EQTLs is because of something going on with hybrid sterility, except for hybrid sterility is really only important in the testes and we're looking in the liver. So, even though looking at um, uh, expression samples in the liver, the fact that the chromosome 17 uh, genetic makeup, genetic architecture, uh, seems to lead to very differential expression um, leading to hybrid sterility. It's having an effect in other tissues as well. Um, also on chromosome 17, just to make things a little bit more interesting, is the MHC region, the major histocompatibility region, which obviously has a, a great effect on the immune system. The liver is um, an important organ in the immune system where um, it's constantly processing blood, looking for foreign invaders, and, and, and starting the immune response um, uh, in kicking in the immune system in response to these foreign invaders. So I don't really have a happy ending to this because one of the problems, and this was sort of even <laughs> brought up at the, at the end of the last talk, We've only got one strain that is showing, that is really driving this effect. And because of that, all of these trans EQTLs on chromosome 17 are all linked together, which is what is giving, I, you know, we, we created one of those hairball uh, uh, diagrams that I'm sparing you of that just shows that everything seems to be interconnected. And at least now with these 156 uh, uh, pre-CC lines, it's impossible to tease apart exactly what trans EQTLs are directly affecting um, downstream genes versus just simply being um, linked genetically to the true trans EQTL. So that's sort of a, uh, just a caution as you're, as you're doing this type of analysis and, and looking for these causative effects. So in summary, um, what I just wanted to describe to you is a new method that we came up with that we, we hope is, uh, will be useful in trying to identify trans EQTLs in situations where you don't have the power be, with the number of samples to do this. Um, and just to point out that as you're doing these, uh, genetic diversity definitely um, affects how well you're able to interpret uh, what's going on. All right, thank you.
so the, the idea of uh, transcutial mapping from cisquial is pretty interesting but what fraction of your transcutials are actually not picked up have you made some estimations or we, try to right right and um if we knew what all the trans EQTLs were, we could. Um, we, we don't have a good estimate for that. I mean, the, the, the one major class of trans EQTLs we know we're ignoring are any kind of QTL that is actually affecting um, the, the structure of a particular protein, a, a, you know, a genetic variant that is within a coding region that then has a downstream effect, and we're not going to see those. It's only going to be the trans EQTLs working but on But in East, you could probably do the calculations and have a rough estimate of what, how much you are missing, right? If you can suggest but, how I do those calculations, we'd but, be happy to do. Yeah, the trans EQTLs. How often you see they are in the proximity on the chromosome? Um, we do see cases in which they are near, and in fact, um, one interesting region we saw on chromosome two previous studies had lumped a huge band together and called it one, and based on our analysis, it seems that actually there were two different loci that were driving it. So it seems like we are able to drill down a bit, but I agree there's gonna be cases where things are just so tightly linked, even though the genetic diversity between these used strains are, 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 is pretty good to allow this, it, you know, we're limited by that, yes. I'm going to refer a little bit to the aspect of the chromatin side. So I was curious whether the trans EQTLs that you find uh, are consistent with the model where they basically affect chromatin 3D interactions and whether you've kind of tried to overlap them with the high C data. So, so that really pertains when, you, when you're talking about the cis interactions. And so if... Um, if it's affecting, you know, the chromatin state or regulatory mechanisms in cysts, then that's what you would see is you might see a correlation with high C data or anything like that. But when you're looking at the trans, it's no longer what that variant is directly affecting um, as far as some downstream gene, but it becomes then the effect of the gene that that QTL was regulating and the fact that that gene is now being differentially regulated it then has a further effect on some genes, possibly within a same uh, metabolic network, or like I said, if it did happen to be a transcription factor, then you know, whatever genes it's regulating, it would be an effect. Thank you. I will not ask you my questions. Just All right. So that late. <laughs> because everybody wants to get to the coffee back All right, there. so I we'll come back that. at 11.15, so we're gonna start 15 minutes late for the next session. Thanks again.